Take and TalkPicks.com. I'm Rob Kruger, and this is episode 86 with dark glamour photographer Abe Robinson. You know, basically it goes from concept, shoot, post, like every single thing. Today's featured guest is Abe Robinson. Abe, are you ready to share with Photo World today? Yes, I am. Abe runs a photography studio called Blind 7 Photography. He is based out of Cleveland, Ohio, and specializes in dark glamour with a commercial fusion. Over the past 18 years, Abe has been published in several magazines, and these publications have span across the world. With a special effects makeup artist on staff, Abe brings the depths of his imagination to life for a wide range of clientele. Abe, welcome to Take and Talk Picks. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely. I just want to get your story out there and share it because the work is pretty phenomenal. There's a lot of cool stuff happening and a big mix happening, but you have your style in there. Can you kind of just get us started with the the day-to-day, the business, the feeling that we have going on of a quote or a mantra that keeps you moving in this direction of what you're doing? Um, Yeah, I do have a quote I kind of live by. It's it's, uh, actually a movie quote. It's uh, act as if. Um, it's from Boiler Room. There's a speech in the movie where uh, I think it's Ben Affleck. He's talking to a bunch of sales representatives, and he says basically it's it's, it's kind of like fake it till you make it, but uh, act as if is more like uh, if you act like you're something, people will start to recognize you are, and if you can build upon it slowly, so you don't have to just try and jump in. Yeah, I like that. And actually, I'm surprised we don't have many more uh, movie quotes that come to the show because seriously, there's a lot of great lines out there and a lot of great writers coming up with these things, but you can apply it in different ways and act as if. That sounds pretty good. I I was always a big uh, proponent of the fake it till you make it kind of mindset (laughs) uh, until I had an interview uh, with a gentleman by the name of Skip Cohen who set me straight and said, you got to get over that, man. That's ridiculous. Um, But I think it serves a purpose in certain areas and kind of, you know, you can't, you can't fake it on a certain job if you have no clue what you're doing, but if you're going to pursue something, just, Hey, you know what? Let's see what happens and pursue it. Just go after it. Well, I think it's less about, uh, you know, actually faking it and and just trying to convince other people that you can do it when you know you can. not It's more about just building your own self-confidence saying that, you know, yeah, you may have not done something like this in the past, but there's no, there's, that's no reason to keep you from it. And you can utilize that to make yourself a better person. Yes. And I think that's why the act as if kind of works a little bit better than the fake it till you make it because it's more direct to that mindset. So that's, that's pretty cool and and smart. So thank you for giving some clarity (laughs) to that, (laughs) that thought for us. But Looking back, I mean, you've been doing this uh, 18 years or professionally 18 years, right? Well, no, actually, I've only been a professional. I would say, well, I use the word professional lightly, um, <laughs> but I've been a professional now for uh, the, the company has been around for eight years. And prior to that, I was just uh, I started off doing gravestone rubbings and pencil artwork and stuff like that. But I picked up a camera and. Uh, about 18 years ago, I started, it was just a 35 millimeter, 35 millimeter disposable, uh, came with a pack of cigarettes actually. <laughs> and, uh, I started taking pictures of gravestones and flowers and stuff like that. And then I just did it for a hobby, just something to help me keep my mind off of things and help me work through the day to day. And then about eight years ago, I had a friend of mine see some of my work and be like, Hey, if I paid you to take my picture, would you? And I said, yeah, sure. So we did the shoot and she paid me 20 bucks and I shot for like five hours and (laughs) produced really bad images. But, you know, I I looked at it as working with a model and working with some, uh, someone else allowed me even more freedom. So I built upon that and built upon that and just born what it is today. So is that what it was, the uh, the friend asking and that just kind of developed into the business? I mean, what got you to the point where it's like, okay, I'm, I'm dropping everything else and I'm going to pursue photography as the main source? Well, it, it, it's kind of, it was kind of a mix. Um, I had spent years working in kitchens. I've been a chef for years and 
I'm I'm a big guy. I'm not uh, the uh, physical fitness kind of guy. So, uh, you know, you get tired working in a kitchen 80 hours a week, standing on your feet. And I, I was looking for a way to express myself, make money, have fun, and I, I'm always been a big learner, and I like to I like to learn constantly. So, photography gave me a way to constantly challenge myself in ways that other that a regular nine to five couldn't. So, I've spent you know the last eight years doing everything I can to hone my craft. I mean, I still watch YouTube videos today. I was watching one earlier on a behind the scenes, so I could learn. Um, and I don't know. It's just it's it's always been a way for me to express myself, but at the same time, I look at my work and I'm my own worst critic. So I never think, you know, I, I never think that my work is as good as it is. I, you know, people tell me all the time, oh, it's great. But I always had that stuck in the back of my head that it's not. So I kind of went off on a thing there, but. <laughs> oh, it's all right. No, I mean, there's some good stuff to take away here. Like Photo World, if you're listening, you know, Abe's been doing this eight years professionally, 18 years in the making. I mean, same here. I've got like 12 years in the making and six years professionally. But this, you know, amount of time behind us and skill built up into what we're doing, it's only taken us to this point and we want to go further. We want to do more. So uh, I'm just like you, Abe, where it's like I want that extra education and constantly finding something new to innovate or reinvent what I'm doing and see if it applies to me or not. And if it doesn't, then I might learn something that could come down the line. I mean, just education is so key, no matter what level you're at. No, I mean, I don't, I don't think that there's any reason that I look at it like this, the day that I photograph something and it looks exactly like what's in my head, what I envision that shoot to be is the day I sell my camera because I no longer have something to strive for. Mm -hmm. I no longer have something to work every day for I, I don't have anything I think that the moment I get that clarity I'll be bored with it right yeah I mean once you achieve perfection that theoretical word then what's what's beyond that so there's no such thing so you gotta go for more right yeah well when we were going through this and like you said we're you know the day you get that perfect shot start to finish everything just worked amazingly we know it doesn't happen like that. And especially running a business doesn't happen like that. Can you recall a time, a learning moment, a failure moment where you tried something and, oh my gosh, that did not work out the way you expected. And uh, you learned a lot from it though. Uh, I mean, you know what? I can honestly say that it's, it's not a one-time thing. It, it's uh, pretty much every shoot. <clears throat> you know, I, I, I do produce a lot of commercial work for clients and you know, we have, uh, especially this time of year, we have, you know, with my my individual style, I end up very busy. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've done work you know, for national haunted houses, national bands, magazine work. Um, I'm shot for hotels and everything else. But it's every time I step onto a set and I look at what I've created, it's it's always a challenge and nothing doesn't matter how much you plan, not everything is going to go exactly to plan. Right. So it's not, I wouldn't say that it's one time in particular where I've failed miserably. I mean, we've all had our, I had, all had that one shoot where I, you know, you get there and, you know, you forgot your batteries or you forget, you know, all of a sudden there's five other photographers in the exact same area and you are all using cheap uh, wireless triggers and you're setting up each other's flashes <laughs> off and, you know, it's, it, it's things like that. You know, I, I've done a couple of group shoots. Uh, OSR is one of them, and it's uh, the Ohio State Reformatory. And you get in there, and there's, you know, 50 photographers, and they're all utilizing, you know, pocket wizards and little tiny, you know, the $7 eBay special triggers. And you start setting your lights off, and you can't get the lighting right. And, yeah, you feel like a failure, but it's, it's those that make you inventive and you need to figure out how to bounce a window light instead of using your strobe that you spent all that money on. Right, right. And uh, I saw, at least with the camera gear, you're a Nikon guy like me. All right. I saw a blog post you did there with uh, the cameras, the what's in your bag kind of thing. And I was like, all right, yeah. I already like this guy. <laughs> I, I definitely, I, I'm definitely pro Nikon, but um, I am one of the weird photographers who isn't 
a hundred percent sided with the brand. <laughs> um, and that's not to say that Nikon's not good. It's to, to say that the reason I picked the Nikon and I picked Nikon to build my bag out of was because it felt good in my hand. Like I went to the camera store. There's this local camera store here in Cleveland. It's called Vans. And it's like a mom and pop, you know, same staff, been there for 10 years. I walked in the door when I wanted to buy my first DSLR and they put down a Canon, a Nikon, a Sony, uh, I think a Pentax and an Olympus in front of me. And I picked each one up and I played with it. And the Nikon, I don't know, I got big hands. The grip on the Nikon worked for me better, but I've, I've shot with Canon. I've shot with Panasonic. I've held a Hasselblad once. Um, but, uh, you know, I, Nikon just seemed to fit best in my hand. Yeah. I mean, when you're looking price for price, these brands are doing the same thing as everybody else. And you kind of have to just go off of, you know, button function or feel in the hand. Like it's seriously, I, I don't know. I get this argument with my students all the time, Nikon or Canon. And I was like, realistically, if I could afford both, I would love to have both Nikon and Canon specifically for a lot of their features. But uh, well, I mean, I started Canon with Nikon, had, so I, I'm landing there. <laughs> that's pretty much what I, you know, I started with I, my, my very first camera. My first non-film camera was a uh, Fuji. It was a Fuji S5000, a little point and shoot. And then I had an Olympus point and shoot and then another Fuji. And then I've just stuck with Nikon for ever since because that's what I got. But, you know, somebody handed me a, a, a mirrorless or a old school Panasonic DSLR. You can still shoot with it. It's not about the equipment. Right. It's more about just having fun with it and learning the equipment. You know what to do with it. Yeah, you, I know Canon's got the weird, well, to us Nikon shooters, it's got the weird back dial. Um, <laughs> and every time I use one, it takes me a few minutes to figure it out. But you can. It's 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 all the same function. And their lenses zoom the wrong way. I don't get it. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can nerd out on gear with you forever, but I don't want to talk about that much. I really want to get into your, your business and stuff and what, what you do, your process. Can you pull out like one thing that you think is the most important or definitely involved in every shoot from start to finish? You've got this process of a workflow from client interaction to the putting on the shoot to post-production. One thing that really stands out for you, though. Um, it's one thing that I've always prided myself on, and it's not something that has to do with gear. It's not something that has to do with actually taking the photos. Anytime I do a shoot, um, it starts with the client interaction. And, you know, I'm an introvert. I'm an artist type. And to be able to sit down with somebody you've never met and actually have a conversation, it's not always the easiest thing in the world. But I find that sitting down with somebody talking about their favorite bands, talking about what kind of movies they like, talking about, you know, what their style is personally allows me to be able to bring out once I'm actually in the shoot. And once I've concepted the shoot, it allows me to bring out more of their personality in it. So there it, it automatically makes the photos that are produced have more depth and more meaning, especially for the client that's, you know, paying for the image and their friends and family because they can see little bits of them in the artwork itself. So the most important thing to me is the actual client consultation. You know, doing a shoot, I would say 95% of my shoots are done with one light, boom stand, one one light modifier, not real a whole lot of fancy equipment. So the majority of it is just talking to people and getting to know them as a client prior to ever picking up the camera. Right. Yeah. I mean, and it's the same, like we do completely different work. I, I mostly do weddings. It's a completely different feel. I mean, I, I wouldn't mind doing a kind of a shoot like yours on a wedding. I think that could be interesting, but you know, when, when <laughs> I'm meeting with, weddings. <laughs> when I'm doing a, a client interaction, it's like, I try to get them away from the whole, you know, pictures and price because there are thousand photographers out there who have a bunch of great portfolio images and a lot of different pricing you can look at, but you're hiring me or they're hiring you. And when they're meeting you, Abe, you know, they got to find out who you are. You got to find out who they are. 
get a good fit and a mix there. Because the pictures, like you said, one light, that's simple enough. We could go with gear all day. You know, I love the Alien B lights. Other people might be saying they need the Pro Photo, but really, it doesn't matter if you know your gear and you know what you do. You got to get past that part and get to the point where it's like, okay, how do I act with my clients? How do they respond to me? Right. And in this day and age, you can talk to somebody and, you know, I might, I might have a personal opinion on a subject that I feel strongly about and that they may feel the exact opposite. Well, if it gets brought up in our initial consultation, I know not to bring that back up or let it get brought back up Mm -hmm. during the actual photo shoot, because making sure the client is comfortable is key. And is the customer always right? No, but they're the ones paying you. They're the ones that are making sure your lights stay on. So yeah, you kind of have to cater to them. So catering to them on in, in an individual level makes them feel special and makes them want to come back. Right, right. And maybe this topic right here is the answer to this next question or you have something different in mind. But for the wide range of listeners, those photographers out there uh, who are tuning in here, can you share with them, with Photo World out there, one thing you think would lead to growth and success in a photography business, regardless of the level they're at right now? Um, <clears throat> individuality. I know it's hard. You know, anybody who has five hundred bucks can go to Best Buy and pick up a, a you know, a point and shoot. Most of the population has an iPhone, which. You know, according to the new ones, you know, it takes better video than most DSLRs. It's it's more about setting. You could take a picture. I could take a picture. We could have five other photographers take the exact same picture, exact same model, exact same dress, exact same setting, exact same lighting. You're going to shoot it completely different than I am because we're individuals and we have an individual style. So and when we take that image and we were to shop the same five clients, five new clients. If yours looks just like person A's, but mine stands out, well, I'm going to get the job. You're not. So creating your own style and creating a niche for, I mean, what I shoot, most people don't like. I mean, they're like, you take me to a, 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 a if I was to take my work to Coca-Cola, they'd like me around Halloween but they're not going to like me for an ad campaign in July because of my, my niche style. My goal as a photographer and as a businessman is to eventually change that and eventually be able to walk into Coke in July and be like, Hey, look, I want to shoot your next ad campaign. This is my work. This is what you should be presenting your audience. And if you're confident in your own style, you can land those gigs that you didn't think you could get before. And you can change the mind of the people who will be hiring because you do stand out amongst the crowd. Right. So I would say that creating your own individual style and sticking to it, you can evolve. I mean, I have, if you look through my portfolio in the last six years, my style has changed a lot. It's gotten cleaner. It's gotten crisper. It's gotten more seamless. And that's just, from practice and learning more and more and more and finding out what I like the last year. If you look at my work, it's, it's all has the same feel to it. If you look at it from three years ago, it has the same feel, but it's edited. It. I just evolved. Right. So if you, you just got to set yourself apart. And that evolution, the, the individuality, we hear this all the time when we talk to other people, when we're learning photography, Oh, you got to find your own style, find your own style. And we don't know what that means. But you just hit it right on the head there, just saying it's different. I evolved over this past eight years going professionally with this. It's very different. Like you can have a certain look and feel that year, but the next year it might be a little bit different. And style is not a thing. It's a development over time until you start to really narrow down, narrow down, niching down, like you said, to this look where it's like, that's an Abe Robinson right there. That's a blind seven photography photo. You can tell, you know, it's just starts to become branded in its appearance. Well, and I also do something as an artist that uh, uh, kind of follows suit with like old school painters. I go through phases where I'll do like a blue phase where everything I edit has like a blue tone to it. 
And then six months later, I switch and I'm, I'm doing everything with green tones or yellow tones or something. So as an artist, I can edit however I want to. So I don't have to stick to a, a color pattern or I, I know you don't have to, oh, I want to make my style of everything I shoot has vignetting. You know, you don't have to pick that one thing and do it to every single photo, no matter what you're shooting. Just style is more of a, I want to say it's, it's because I don't do the exact same thing to every single image, but I do have a similar process, I guess, mm -hmm. how I get to there and the certain, certain feel I want. Yeah, I mean, it's such an obscure word to try to describe or define when you're talking art and, you know, yeah. the creative side with style. It really is difficult to to put into words, but it's just, oh, man, it's a learning curve, you know? You got to just <laughs> get out there and do it, photo world, go. Uh, when, we're, when we're going through this stuff, we have these highlights, these great moments where it's like, oh, my goodness, I never realized lighting until I did that, you know, or whatever this little light bulb moment is these aha moments we have a ton of them throughout our career just like those failure moments you learn all the time or you have these small successes all the time can you pull out a story where you tried something different and it just clicked for you right there hmm. yeah i got one uh it was actually from a shoot uh in was it march i uh <clears throat> there's a, a an abandoned funeral home it's not abandoned but it's it's very, very run down and it's been closed for years. And uh, a friend of mine owns it and he let us in there. Well, the place was trashed. I mean, it's might as well be an abandoned building. And uh, I was shooting a model from out of town along with a large group of other photographers and models that were there that day. And I was having an issue. The one room I wanted to shoot this model in and I wanted to shoot her with a lampshade on her head. Um, she was nude. So there was no, like, the way the room was set up, it was very small, and it was just trash piled on the floor. There was no place to put a light, but it wasn't bright enough to shoot. I'd have had to shoot it like ISO 6400, and it w wouldn't have given me the images I was looking for. So after, after thinking about it for a minute, this is from a movie too, I John McClaned it. <laughs> I literally took a speed light the pocket wizard and I duct taped it to her back <laughs> and I fired it via the pocket wizard on my camera right up into the uh, lampshade that was on her head. So it looked like her head was lit like a light bulb. So that was kind of my aha moment of figuring out a way to light a model with impossible odds. I love it. John McLean did. John McLean had plans, you know, you got to change it up when you get in yeah. there. You never know what you're going to be presented with. <laughs> That's I mean, awesome. he, 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 he taped the guns to his back in the movie, so I picked the speed light. <laughs> right on, right on. I love that. Um, but seriously, that's that's a brilliant little aha moment of just, okay, situation, what do I do? And not freaking out, you know, just really looking through, okay, it seems weird. It seems unorthodox and totally different. Nobody does this. Let's see what happens, you know, and you just, yeah. you're duct taping your models back. Like, <laughs> yeah, that, that's a fun, let's remove the light now situation. <laughs> <laughs> the nice thing it was, it was really hot in that room for some reason. It was like 40 degrees outside. Not even, it was like 30. There was still snow on the ground and, but it was so hot in that room. It just fell right off. I think I saw the shot you were describing on your either website or blog, one of those areas, but um, yeah, it, just to let you know that image is on there there's no photoshop in that image oh nice i would say 90 percent of my 99 percent of my work has no photoshop in. just a in camera situation a, a mix between lighting and developing mm -hmm. yeah i'm not a i'm not a big like if there's photoshop you can tell there's photoshop because you can see the, the layers or you can tell the background is like completely out of this world right yeah i mean and Photoshop's a great tool, but uh, man, just it raised the bar now knowing that some uh, uh, the majority of what you're doing is is not utilizing that. So that's kind of awesome. So, well, it's a com it's a combination because you've got the, you know getting your lights right in camera, mm -hmm. and then having a team. Team is a big a big part of what I do. I don't have like a huge crew. We don't have like 
you know, on staff hairstylists and, and all sorts of, you know, we, we don't have like a giant wall of makeup artists. We have one makeup artist who does all of our SFX stuff and most of our beauty stuff. And then we have, uh, you know, a hairstylist that I bring in on occasion. Um, so it's having a good makeup artist definitely helps because I don't have to go in and re Photoshop somebody's, you know, a gouge. I can have her just put it on and right. it looks good. Yeah. So, yeah, that's awesome. And really it's just those finer details. It's always in the details, right? You know, just to really bring everything oh, yeah. together. There's one thing that bothers me more than anything with people who like, I, I love to look at artwork that is similar to mine. Like I love looking at the dark artwork and there's a lot of magazines and things like that. But one thing that really bothers me is that every time I see somebody who's tried, it's, they never get the makeup close enough to the eye. Like there's no, that, like, I don't know what it is. Like they, they, it's like they tried and they were like, ah, screw it. You got to take the makeup to the eye. <laughs> <laughs> you got to go the extra mile, you know, your model yeah, can handle I, it. I know it's uncomfortable <laughs> to be drawn on somebody's eyeball, but you got to get it up there. <laughs> <laughs> get in, go big, go home kind of thing, you know, just yep. <laughs> let's do it. Well, when we're learning and getting all these great resources and tools, I'm hoping Photo World's loving the podcast and your interview today here, Abe. But do you have an app or an internet resource that you've utilized you think Photo World could benefit from knowing about? Uh, I use Invoice to Go and uh, Square a lot and LensTag. LensTag is definitely a, a, a useful tool for photographers. It logs all your equipment, and when you register it, uh, it's free, and it's even got a uh, – Chrome extension. So when you're surfing the internet and I'm logged into Chrome, you can have the app, uh, you can have the extension on your thing and it's searching the internet for my copyrighted images. Nice. Lens tag is an amazing app. It, it gives you the price of your gear used and new. You log your serial numbers. Um, it's They've already recovered a bunch of people's gear. They got stolen um, through it because when you register, you have to take a picture of the serial number and the gear. So they keep all the records. So if, you know, somebody steals my camera bag, I can take that to the police and be like, here, these are all my, this is all my gear. This is all the serial numbers. And then if it shows up at a pawn shop down the street, they have all the proof they need. Right. That's awesome. And it's a free app. So, and every, like once a month, it emails you and lets you know, these are all the places on the internet where your work is right now. Very cool. So that's pretty brilliant. Yeah, I didn't know they did the uh, the image copyright thing. I, I just recently heard the, about them for tracking your lenses and making sure there's an extra protection out there for that. Um, but Photo World, I'll have these links and Abe's social links and uh, website, of course, on the show notes page. Just type Abe in the search bar; his show notes will pop right up. Uh, if you can't find him directly for whatever reason, but sorry, you were going uh, going to say something there. Oh, no. Uh, I was going to say, uh, lens tag is not only um, for lenses and camera bodies. You can put, like, I have uh, my GoPros on there, my uh, my battery grips, are I have those registered because those all have individual serials on them. Nice. Pretty much if it's got a serial number, you can register it. That's awesome. That's really awesome. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get taken care of on that one this week. I think I'll go through my bag because it uh, can't hurt, especially with a free no, app. No. Oh, my goodness. That's awesome. Well, and they have an they actually have an individual that approves that. So it's not like it's just a an ad, you know some guy made an algorithm that automatically approves everything. Right. It, they actually have somebody who goes, oh okay, yep, that matches. That's cool. Yep, that matches. So nice, very cool. Well, while we're talking about gear and uh, you know we all have our go to stuff, other than the camera body because we definitely need that. What's one piece of gear you could not live without? I really like my Tokina lens. I have a Tokina 16 to 28 wide angle. All right. It's a 2.8. I, I, I picked it up the last year. I, I shot for the longest time with just a 24 to 70 and uh, a 50 mil macro. And then I picked up a 105 macro and a 16 to 28. The 16 to 28, I think I, I don't think I've used another lens other than once in a blue moon for, since I bought it. Yeah. Like it's pretty much been on the camera. Yeah, Tokina doesn't seem to get as much press as I think they should. They have some really awesome lenses. And they... I rented I rented the Nikon uh, fourteen to 
24, I think oh, it is. Oh, it's a beast. <laughs> it's a beautiful lens. But I thought, I think for $2,400 or twenty over two grand, the $600, $699 Tokina, I think it blows it away. Yeah. I think it actually, it's got crisper edges, I think. I think it's got a better sweet spot. And it's a beautiful lens. Like, it's, it's just, it's got great depth, great aspect ratios as far as, like, it's astrophysical. I thought it, 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 it that, and it, the, the lens isn't as large as the 14 to 24, like the actual glass. Yeah, I would say either that or, uh, lately it's been the GoPro. <laughs> <laughs> little, like the little video on hand, keeping the behind the scenes going. Yeah. Which, yeah, Photo World, you got to check it out so you can kind of just see some of the, man, some of the elaborate sets you come up with and things you got going on. It's pretty sweet. Yeah, I'd much rather, uh, I think on my website, there's probably close to 300 images. And out of those 300, I think there is five that have Photoshop. <laughs> and so if you pretty much, other than I think the one that is the, it's like a desert with a sky and a car. Other than that, all the backgrounds, what you see, I was actually there. That's pretty awesome. Well, we're about to wrap it up here today, and uh, definitely thank you for sharing with Photo World Abe here. But before we go, could you please share with them one parting piece of guidance and then the best way that we can get in touch with you, whether it be your website or some sort of social media, and then we'll say goodbye. All right. I'll start off with the website. Uh, it's blind7photography.com. Um, it's the easiest way. There's all the links, all the social media, everything right on the front page. Um, so it's easy to find me. As far as parting wisdom goes, I would say don't give up. This is one of the hardest businesses to run, to be in. It's going to run you down. It's going to, you're going to lose friends. You're going to lose family. You're going to lose everything, but it's all worth it in the end. Just keep going. Perseverance. I love it. Yep. <laughs> keep going, Photo World. And I think there are ways to keep your friends and family, but. You know, be careful because you can lose sight of some things. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, well, working ninety, working ninety plus hours a week to get it going can can take the toll. I know. Sometimes I'm wondering what the heck am I doing some weeks because it gets so busy. And uh, oh, and always, always be thankful for your significant other. <laughs> if you have one, make sure you thank them once in a while for putting up with you. Yes. You're a photographer. <laughs> thank them and uh, embrace the little breaks you do get from time yes. to time. Well, Abe, I cannot thank you enough for your time today and sharing such great value with Photo World. They thank you and happy shooting. Thanks. Goodbye.